morning. You have your Bibles open up to Philippians chapter 4. We've been working our way through the book of Philippians and we'll look to finish it this morning. So we'll pick it up here at the end of chapter 4. Verse 14, Paul says, Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica you sent me help for my needs once again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grass withers, flower fades. The word of our God will stand forever. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to get together this morning and to look to it and to read it. Lord, we ask that you'd bless this time as we look to your word. We pray that you'd open our hearts, you'd open our minds, and um, you just fill this room with your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. An American and, and, and a Russian were discussing how great their native countries are, and the American said, you know, the United States is amazing because of the freedom we have here. Um, Why, if I wanted to, I could fly to Washington, I could head to the White House, I could walk into Biden's office, I could bang my fist on his desk and say, Mr. President, I don't like the way you're running this country. The Russian says, oh, well, I can do that in Russia. Oh, really? (laughs) Says the American, he says, absolutely. The Russian said, I could fly to Moscow, head to the Kremlin, walk into Putin's office, bang my fist on his desk and say, Mr. President, I don't like the way Biden is running that country over there. (laughs) You could substitute any president you want in there. I just picked Biden because he's the current one. Uh, People get disgusted with politics and this guy's running things wrong and that guy's running things wrong. Paul lived at a time when Caesar Nero was the emperor of Rome and pretty much the known world at the time. And Paul looked at opportunities to share the gospel with people like that. He wanted to be put in positions where he could share the gospel with someone like Caesar Nero, and, and Trump, Biden, any president put all their worst characteristics together and they still probably wouldn't amass to the, the horrific nature of Caesar Nero. Um, what would you do if you were trapped in the White House for, you know, a couple years? Would you be a, a, a good influence? Just be bitter. (laughs) Verse 14. Paul says, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. What trouble is he in? Paul is in prison, probably kind of under a type of house arrest there in Rome. And he has access to speaking to different soldiers and maybe members of households and things like that. But nevertheless, he's in prison. He's writing a letter 
to who? He says, he says you guys shared with me. What, what guys? He's talking to the church of Philippi. Remember when we started the book of Philippians, we went and we read about who are some of these characters. You had Lydia. Remember her? You had that possibly that little slave girl that was con- converted. And then obviously you have the Philippian jailer. Uh, these people's families, there's probably other people in jail, jail probably prisoners and workers. You had, a, you had a kind of a core group of people that would have expanded there, and he's writing a letter to them. He's in prison in Rome for the gospel, and he says, it was kind of you to share in my troubles. Well, how are they sharing in Paul's mission? How are they sharing with them? Let's see. Verse 15, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. The the church is in in Macedonia, and Macedonia is just north of Greece, and, and that's where Paul first started taking the gospel into Europe. He hits Philippi first. The other churches in that part of, in that region would be um, Thessalonica and Berea, okay? Um, and, and Paul tells the Philippians, you shared with me. And look, look what he says, you see it, verse 15? How did they share? Giving and receiving. They supported him financially, okay? That's, the, that's kind of the gist of it. They helped support him financially. He'd write letters back to him. He'd encourage them. He'd show up there. He'd preach the gospel. But when he was traveling, they were supporting him. Or helping, at least. Verse 16. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. He said, this isn't the first time you helped me. Um, You helped me even when I was in Thessalonica. And... um, it seems like of all the churches he planted, uh, this was the only one that was helping him financially. But I'm sure others did it in different times, but it seems that way. Verse 17, not that I seek the gift. He's like, I'm not asking for money. But I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. And the fruit he's talking about comes from giving um, through giving financially, that's that's what he's referring to. It's it's hard not to take to, to take money and to make money the priority of your life. It is a struggle every single person has. Um, the Bible talks a lot about money. It's one of the biggest subjects in the Bible because um, God knows it's a struggle for us. Jesus talks a lot about money, and Jesus makes it real simple for us. He says this, you can't serve God and and money. (laughs) The reason is, it's because you're probably serving one or the other. (laughs) And it can't be a two-headed monster. And, 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 And the reason the Bible talks about it is because God knows this is a real struggle for us. This is very hard. It is hard not to have a tight grip on money. Everything kind of revolves around it. I get it. Um, Paul's not saying, I'm not writing to you so you send me more money. I, I'm writing to you because I want you to know you're sharing in my heavenly reward. This is crazy. He says, he says, he says it's about the fruit. What's the fruit? It's the profit from what's coming from all this. The fruit would be the result. And there's different results for them giving. It's, it's kind of their own personal benefit it's to your own personal good but it's also to the benefit of the body of Christ the result ultimately is the gospel's being preached in places that that Lydia wasn't able to go the gospel's being preached in places that the Philippian jailer might not be willing to go but yet they can still participate Proverbs says this about giving, one, free, one gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters 
will himself be watered. There's a personal benefit there. It has something to do with your character. And, and we've talked about this before, the, the idea of a generous... Generosity being part of your character is one of the most important things. Jesus said this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Just like Paul's not saying literally there's fruit, he's saying, you know, you're kind of storing your treasures in heaven when you're doing this. Jesus said, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for with the measure you use it will be measured back to you. Paul said this to another church. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully bountifully each one must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver there is fruit in in personal life because you're learning how to trust God and to have a loose grip on, on something like money and, and to say, hey, this is for the kingdom. Um, God's all for it. God loves a cheerful giver. He notices what's happening. Did you notice this verse? Not Verse 17, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your, look at that word, credit. He's, he's, he's keeping a, 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 some kind of record Evidently, he keeps and he notices. He doesn't notice not only what's been given, an amount doesn't count, we know that, but, but the attitude in which it is. Verse 18, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. Epaphroditus must have showed up with tangible gifts, and, and part of that would have been money. Because he needed it to, for, for help for various things. He, it, it, he says this, The gifts you sent through Epaphroditus, look what he calls it, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Paul was content. He wasn't asking for anything. But look how he compares the financial gift that they're giving him. He's drawing our attention to the Old Testament. And if you remember in the Old Testament, when, when Noah got off the ark and offered a sacrifice to God after that disaster, right? Think about it, what had to take place. It said as the aroma went up, it was pleasing to the Lord. When you read through books like um, Leviticus, and it's talking about the sacrificial system, Leviticus opens up and it starts talking about all these different sacrifices, but after each one, if it's done with the right motive, guess what? It's a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Paul just takes... Um, their financial sacrifice and says it's just like the Old Testament that's pleasing to the Lord finances can be a type of sacrifice you know when we were moving over here it was a financially it was crazy the craziest thing about it to me is that I'm the guy signing the papers. I'm the last guy you want signing papers for. You can imagine how much money this place is worth. I remember sitting there going like, does anybody know who I am? <laughs> like, and they want me to sign this stuff? Are you kidding me? Um, it was a lot of money. It was a lot of money. And we didn't have a whole lot of money. I remember I was meeting with people that were advising me 
on how to generate more money. And, you know, somebody's like, hey, I have a meeting with this person, I have a meeting with that person. To be honest, after a while, I'm like, I'm done with those meetings. One guy, this was a pastor, he goes, you know, um, uh, we're, we're, you know, our church is good at raising money. He, 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 he called me in for just, he wanted to meet with me. And then I realized he was, he was trying to sell me. He wanted to be my advisor on raising money, but he wanted to be paid for it. <laughs> but he goes... He goes, here's what you do. He goes, you find your, your, your big donors in the church. And side note, I don't know what you tithe. I, I, I really don't know what you tithe. You know why? I don't want to know what you tithe. You know why? I might treat you different. <laughs> I might be like, oh, yeah, you cheap chump. You think you're hot. Or be like, hey, there she is. Oh, you know, like I don't even want to go there in my mind, okay? I'm afraid of myself. But this guy goes, here's what you do. You find the big donors, and you sit down with them, and you tell them you need to raise money. And then when they write you a check, you look them in the eyes, and you say, is that a sacrifice for you? <laughs> and he goes, and you keep your hands under the, under the, the, the table. And I said, why? He goes, so, so they don't see your hands shaking when you ask them that. Because, and, and I was, looked at him, I was like, thanks for the advice. You know, and I remember leaving that being like, forget you, man. Like, number one, I'm not putting myself in that situation, but I'm not going to guilt anybody. Like, are you kidding me? Because this is the Lord's deal. You know, something like that, it's, it's, it's God's deal. It's not, it's not that he needs me to put the squeeze on anybody. You don't give out of guilt. You're looking at it wrong if that's the way it's coming, if it's coming from you that way. God loves a cheerful giver. What is your motive? This is for the kingdom. This is for the kingdom. Do you remember? And, and yeah, he keeps record, but guess what? Do you remember what Jesus did at the temple? He took his disciples to the temple and they probably sat off to the side where they could watch people giving. And he, he taught them. He's like, you don't want to tithe like that dude because that dude walks up and is like, here's the half of my paycheck, everybody. Oh, yay. Do, 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 do. You know, and it's like, here it is. Clink, wow, yeah, look how amazing he is. He's such a good giver. Pat him on the back. Jesus says, if that's what you're looking for, the praises of men, that's it. You've got it. Good job. But that's all you're getting. And he said, watch. And he specifically pointed out this little old lady to his disciples. They're sitting there. I'm, I'm telling you, this is how it played out. He's like, watch this. And she walks up and she took the smallest amount of money that anybody could muster up, she put it in the tithe box. He said, that's what I'm talking about. It's not about the amount. It's, it's, it, that was a real sacrifice for her. That's what he said. That was a real sacrifice for her. That was hard for her. She has to put herself in a position where she goes, this, I could use that, you know, but Lord, that's yours. I'm giving that to you. That's how he taught them. Again, Proverbs says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. I heard about this pastor in Missouri. He went on social media blasting his congregation, telling them they're poor, broke, busted, and disgusted for not buying him a luxury watch. No joke. You all know I asked for one last year. Here it's all the way in August. I still ain't got it. He said in a minute long clip of his remarks. This is how I know you're still poor, broke, busted, and disgusted because of how you've been honoring me. I'm not worth your McDonald's money. I am not worth your Red Lobster money. I'm not worth your Louis Vuitton money. I'm not worth your Prada money, your Gucci money. And he goes, you ain't said nothing. Let me 
kick down the tent. He's just blasting them. Now, what if you were at a church like that? What if I did something like that? You would say, okay, Lord, I gave you that money thinking (laughs) this was honorable. And then you don't go to a church like that, let me just tell you. Then you have permission to say, we'll we'll find a different church. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. You would say, you know what, this isn't the, the right way um, that, that finance is, is being used, that Josh needs another um, Movado watch. Which, by the way, if I did that, I wouldn't spend it on a Movado watch. I'd spend it on something much, much more um, vain. <laughs> Just joking. Um, it's the Lord's money. And that's who it's being given to. Verse 19, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Does this mean uh, if we're giving, he will give us in return whatever we want? No, many times what we want is contrary to his will. It's really saying, Compare your needs to Christ, to, to the riches of God. Is there any comparison whatsoever? No, because who is the source? God. And, and, and ultimately, his riches come through Jesus Christ. His standard is his glory. And we access it by faith. God all, has all the resources he needs. But guess what? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He is concerned about you, and he will take care of you. Verse 20, he's talking about all this and how gracious God is, and he just kind of busts into praise here. To our God and Father be glory forever. And ever, amen. He's just thinking about the riches of God and he praises him. And then he's final greetings here. Verse 21, he says, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. What, who's he talking about? Lydia, the little slave girl, the Philippian jailer, their families, other people who've been saved. He says, the brothers who are with me greet you. I mean, he's, Paul's always got a group of a posse with him. He's got uh, Timothy. Obviously, Epaphroditus has shown up. Uh, Tychicus, Aristarchus, Silas. Uh, maybe Justice is with him on this one. He's going back and forth. In verse 22, he says this, All the saints greet you. There's Christians here. And then look at this phrase. The end of verse 22, Especially those of Caesar's household. Now this to me is very interesting because remember earlier he said you share in the fruit. Obviously if you're a giving person there's fruit that's being developed in your own life but not only that I think this is part of the fruit he's talking about. There are people over here getting saved because of the way you helped me. And who? Members of the royal family? Possibly. He might be referring to house in general, maybe soldiers, but it could very well be high-ranking officials of whose household. Do you know? Caesar Nero. This guy was a psychopath, to put it lightly. I was just reading some stuff on him a while ago. He, this is bizarre, he actually married kind of one of the the political bigwigs, and uh, she smarted off to him one day, and so he he hit her, she's pregnant, and she fell down, and then he kicked her to death. He kicked her to death. Then... 
after that, he, he found the little boy that resembled her. He took him, castrated him, uh, made him grow his hair out and, and dress like a woman, and paraded him around as almost like a, a reincarnate of her, and then married him. This, this is the king of the world at the time. <laughs> this, and, and then you, you hear other weird stuff about, about Nero. Um, to me, that sounds like a place I wouldn't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. But then you got to back up and say, is God going to put people in that atmosphere? Yeah. Are there boundaries to the gospel? No. Is God going to put people in the White House when Biden's president? Yeah. Is he going to put people in his ear? Yeah. Is he going to do that with the, whoever the next president is? Is he going to do that with this president? That? Yeah. As disgusted as you are with them, is he going to do that? Yeah. Are there any boundaries to the gospel? No. What about their staff? No. What about in the Kremlin? <laughs> no. He's going to put people there. Who's the right guy to share the gospel in Nero's palace, in Nero's vicinity? Who's the right guy? The Apostle Paul. Does he need support to do this? Yes. Who is going to support him? The church. The body of Christ. Who is going to get the credit? The church. The body of Christ, including Paul. They're not only helping Paul, they're serving the Lord by, by financially supporting him here. Verse 23, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. He says that, and he's still in chains. Why? Because he understands this word grace very well. It's all about God. It's all for God. It's all because of God. And the next day, Epaphroditus is probably going to roll this scroll up they're going to seal it. He's going to put it in his bag and he's going to head to Philippi and deliver this letter to them. The details about the way the Philippians gave, you could almost read through this, sip your cup of coffee and be like, oh, that's nice that they're giving and it's not that important. But we learn um, that when we, give, um, when, when we give to God's servants and the, to the body of Christ, we're also giving to the Lord. And he records that, every cent of it. It's, it's pretty, pretty interesting when you back up and you think about the big picture here. This is the whole body here working together. There's a story in the Old Testament where David was... Um, he was out fighting with his men. And at the time, they oversaw a city named Ziklag... And he's, they all left Ziklag and they left behind the, 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 the kids and, and the women and they went to fight. And then when they came back, they, the city was burning. Smoke was coming from it. And you could imagine the, the feeling in your heart and in your gut when that's happening. And they're running back and they get there and everybody's gone. The Amalekites had come in while they were gone and took everybody captive and, and left. And they had a big jump on them. And, and so David said, what do we do? And God's like, go. And so they said, let's go. And they, I mean, they just came back from a war, from a journey, and now they're right into another one. And they, they, over time, they get to like this river and this brook, and there's just some guys who are just like, I can't. I can't go. I can't go any fur further. And they say, stay here. Guard the camp here. We'll leave some stuff behind, and we're going to keep going. And they did. They went, they found the Amalekites, they defeated them, they even got spoils, their spoils that they took from other places. They took those, they saved all the, all the kids and, and their wives, and they bring everybody back. And when they get back, 
David said, all right, we're going to divide this evenly, even with the people who stayed behind. And there were some people who were arguing with him. who we were saying, they don't deserve anything. They don't get any of the credit. And, and David even called them worthless men. But, but he said this. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is, is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. This was the principle that was set. The one who goes, the one who sends and participates, they all share in the credit. You see? That's the principle. It's kind of what we see here. Paul says, look, you shared with me, you partnered with me, it's to your credit. Okay? Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is what Jesus said. Okay? Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptize in the name of, in the, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Look at those two words, by the way. Go and make. Those are pretty strong verbs. Okay? Go. Make. This word, teach. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. God, Jesus was really specific with you and me. Do you know that? It's not like we have to like fumble around trying to figure out what we're supposed to do as Christians. Are you a Christian? You have a very specific purpose and mission that our Master has given us. You know what it is? Go. Make. Teach. Um, God really cares about the world. Like he really does. Like he really cares about people who are lost. He's so concerned about them. You might know people. You might have a friend that God touched their life to such a degree that they're like, I'm going to be a missionary. And you're like, what? That's crazy. You're going to go where? You're going to do that? Why? Is it because they love those people? It's because God loves them. And God touched their heart and their mind to bring them the good news that you don't have to be separated from God. He wants to be with you for eternity, and he sent Jesus Christ to fix the problem. It's the gospel. It's the good news. The Great Commission uh, uh, here, we're, uh, I'm doing some, you know, you do like staff reviews, and we sit down, and, um, you, you know, you work here and everything. This is what I do. <laughs> I read it. Do you align yourself with this? Yeah, okay, then we're on the right team. <laughs> this is what it's all about, the Great Commission. This is the big picture. And where is the mission? Well, you have to go. Now, sometimes this is across the ocean. Um, there, there's some people in this body who within a week, um, this week, they're going to the Philippines. To do what? To, to share the gospel. On Monday, I'm going to Esperanza High School. And at lunch, uh, there's, a, there's a woman who buys a ton of pizzas We take them into the, in, into the gymnasium, and we stand outside, and we say, hey, there's pizza in here. And kids are like, ooh, ooh. And they come in, they get the pizza, they sit down, and then I got a guy up there, and he says, let me tell you my story, and let me tell you how I met Jesus Christ. And he shares the gospel with them. 
And sometimes it's this guy, sometimes it's this lady, sometimes it's this person, sometimes it's that person. And it's a mission field. And talk about a mission field, right? Whether it's across the street or whether it's across the ocean, we are called to go. Are you willing to go? There are people who are willing. There are people who are called, and there are people who are called to support those people who are called. You see? And who gets the credit? Who gets the credit? The body. The body. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So you kind of take that in reverse. You preach, they hear, then they believe. You see it? And how are they to preach unless they are, look at the word, sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. It's the, it's the whole body participating in this thing. Paul, remember this. Look, look, look what he did. He planted the church in Philippi. He's in prison in Rome. He's writing this letter. But do you remember what happened? He was sent by who? The church of Antioch, long time ago. And now, while he's being sent, he's being supported also by the church of Philippi. It's the body. It's the whole body coming together for the same mission. And you and I get to be a part of it in some way, shape, or form. Here's the big picture. By the way, one, one other thing on this. Does God need your support? Is he like, oh, it, depends, it depends this week on how the tithes come in at Calvary Chapel, your Belinda. We'll see what we can accomplish. <laughs> Is that what's happening? He doesn't need your money. You know, like, like I was saying earlier, when, when that whole, they're, they're like, Josh, you've got to put up a, a thermometer, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and you've got to go start grabbing people when they're walking out and, and turning them upside down and shaking the, all the change out of their pockets, okay, which I've thought about. <laughs> no, this is his deal. <laughs> he doesn't need you. You get to participate. That's what tithing is about. That's what giving is about. You see, God's work carried on in God's way will never lack God's resources. Hudson Taylor said that. We're all part of the Great Commission. Remember what my part is? Pastors and teachers to do what? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. You're going you're gonna to go out those doors, and as you walk out, you're heading to your mission field, wherever that is. I don't know where it is. It could be the Philippines. It could be Esperanza High School. It could be th that person who sits across from you at work. But my job is to equip you, to encourage you, and we're all to go out and to do the work. And I have my own, you know, things that I do. We all do it. We all participate. But we do know this. God's going to put people in Caesar Nero's household. Because no one is off limits. And they need to be sent to those places. And we need to support those places. There's lots of opportunities you know I, I put there's lots of work to be done but there's lots of opportunities for us that's what it really is it's not like we got to go to work we have opportunities in front of us and until he returns we're going to keep looking for those opportunities and and yeah that means money is is a tangible way to to help accomplish a lot of these things and so in in some way shape or form make sure you're committed to being a part of the mission. Look at how many people are involved in this here. Multiple churches, multiple bodies, multiple people. 
But Paul's the, Paul's the one saying we all get the credit. Okay? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to get together this morning and to read this and to think about it and to just be encouraged by it. Lord, we pray that our body here would be all about the Great Commission. And we would be involved in it in, in, in many ways, locally and, and uh, um, moving out into distances, Lord. However you want us to do that. And we pray that you, you continue to use um, people here and to speak to us so that we can continue to serve the mission that you gave us. We ask that you would fill us with your spirit and do that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we have concluded the book of Philippians. You could see, actually, the next book is Colossians that we'll get into. Um, uh, uh, and Philemon, after that. These are the books that he wrote from his, his prison, time in prison there in Rome. But here's the deal. Next Sunday, um, well, in three Sundays is Easter. And two Sundays is Palm Sunday, so that leaves one open Sunday. I don't want to start Colossians next Sunday and then wait two weeks and then pick it up from there. So we'll do more of like a... Actually, next Sunday I, I read is St. Patrick's Day, so maybe we'll talk about missions a, a, a little bit or missionary or something like that. But it'll probably have a, a lot to do with the gospel. And so I'm telling you that because... Uh, sometimes, you know, if you're witnessing to somebody and you've got a friend and you've been talking to them and you're sharing the gospel with them and you're like, I kind of want them to hear this from a different angle or somebody else can talk to them, then bring them to church, you know, on the next uh, number of Sundays. As those next three Sundays, the, the gospel message will be pretty um, heavy coming from the pulpit, okay? So I wanted to remind you of that. Um, during the week, I encourage you to get plugged in and, and be a part of fellowship and things like Wednesday night. There's, a, there's Bible studies and there's times of prayer and there's other studies throughout the week, so I encourage you to join us for those. Right now, there's going to be people up here to pray with you after service if you need prayer for anything. Otherwise, I pray the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. I pray the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace. God bless you. Thank you.